NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at SaveWithConrad.com. It's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And, of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the hardcore legend, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? Conrad, I'm feeling great uh, about the show and about myself because I just realized that I had the guts and the passion to make that eight-hour drive. Yeah, you did. That's right. Probably nine with stops. Got in in the wee hours of the morning. Why? Because we feel like doing it live in studio is the best way to go. And you uh, traveled here from Louisiana? Is that right? That's right. Lafayette, where I was um, at a comic con. Uh, love doing the cons. They're not for everyone. Right. Have you, have you been to cons? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I, I just name dropped Beverly D'Angelo. I, right. I, I, Beverly, when she did her first con in Pittsburgh, she was like emotionally just wiped out just from the constant, you know, you, you, the, con, the constant need to stay up. Yes. So uh, it's it's a long haul. To WWE's credit, I guess it's to their credit, you, they're nev- they never put their superstars in a situation where there's anything but a line. Yes. So WWE appearances are two, maybe three hours tops. Right. But in these cases, you're there seven, eight hours, and... Uh, and it's a grind. It's a grind unless you love it. Yeah. So I do. I do really enjoy it. And the week before, maybe it's two weeks before. I think it's been two weeks now. I took my son to uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Alaska. For the Alaska Comic Con, uh, Fairbanks is only ten minutes from North Pole, Alaska. So I went on Airbnb, and as soon as I saw this elf house, I went, "That's the house, brother." That's the house. We had this beautiful little elf house. We checked out the Santa Claus house. At first, Mickey was a little disappointed. When we got there, it was 24 degrees. Right. When we left, it was negative 24 degrees. Oh, my. And when I got back home, it was 76 degrees. A turnaround of 100 degrees. My goodness. But it, was a good, it wasn't a great con financially. So, uh, you know, on one hand, you're like, well, what am I doing here halfway around the world? And I could have done the same in a, you know, at a memorabilia store. But we had a great time. We got stuck twice in snow drifts. And on both occasions, total strangers just helped me out for an hour. And in one case, it was uh, 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 a member of the uh, Air Force, right. um, a tech, I think, tech or a specialist. And she came over, had no idea who I was, helped me happily for over an hour. And, uh, and then two volunteers or workers from the local church came over, and the three of them dug me out. So I told the, the woman, who absolutely would not take a tip, and I eventually, like, pretty much forced a bill into her hand. And I said, like, just take your husband out for a nice meal. And I said, and uh, in case you have any wrestling fans, just tell him you helped Mick Foley out. She said, I, I'm not a fan. I said, that's okay. Somebody might know you. And, yes. And the next day after we posted that on social media, there was uh, a post from the specialist's husband wow. who was a fan and it was just it just made me feel good you know helping strangers out you know being kind to animals all those little things are really i think they're really important is this your first trip to the north pole first trip to north pole alaska i had hit uh anchorage a few years ago for an indie show because it was the only state in the United States I had not worked in. So this is your second time. This was the second trip. Wow. And we really liked it. Yeah, it was fun. Like, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, as the time goes by, you'll forget how much money you made at the con. You'll never forget that. Never forget that trip. Yeah, it was was a good father-son trip, and I had Mickey taking photos and love these things. So I've got a couple more as long as we're talking about cons. Sure. 
Uh, I'll be heading to um, Richmond, Virginia, uh, the 24th through 26th, I believe that is, of March, and then on to WrestleCon. WrestleCon's going to be awesome. WrestleMania is happening uh, after right. night yeah. one. I know you and Mickey James are fired up about that. But we are. What days are you going to be at WrestleCon? Do you know off the top of your head? All four, brother. I love it. I love so it. So I'm just hoping that uh, the supply <laughs> doesn't run out. The demand doesn't run out on day three. So I can have people from around the world taking lonely, lonely Foley photos. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love that. Um, I got to ask about North Pole, though. I don't think I'll ever get up there. Is, it, is there a lot of Santa influence? Like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. They have a place called the Santa Claus House. Uh, it's been around for, I don't know, 70 years or more, and they're famous for sending Santa letters out uh, around the world with that North Pole um, postage stamp. Yeah. Uh, and there's, you know, you go you pass by McDonald's, and I'll probably uh, send Grillo this photo so he'll see, and, like, the big... You know, the the arches are there, but it's like a 100-foot or 70-foot candy cane-wrapped pole. Oh, wow. So it's 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 really cool. They play it up. They're really proud of it. Uh, they have their own brand of coffee, North Pole Coffee, which is outstanding. My only, uh, one of my regrets is that I didn't grab a bunch of, like, K-cups right. from a local store. And when I remembered it at the airport, I went on Amazon, and they don't deliver. So it was it was it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed it. Well, listen, I uh, I don't know what I expected, but I always love hearing about your travels. North Pole, man, you got North to check Pole, a box Alaska, a lot of brother. A friend of mine, one of the Santas from the uh, I Am Santa Claus movie, did a six month stint there at the house, and that's one of those things in the back of my mind. I'm like, ah, maybe when I'm 65 or so, maybe I can be that guy who takes on that role for six months at a time. I love that. Just put it out there. Well, let's talk about something else we put out there recently. Sting. He's yes. our topic today, and believe it or not, in just a few days, uh, he is going to be 64 years old. It's going to happen on March 20th. Uh, boy, you two have had uh, quite the story together. And, you know, we uh, had a little fun a few episodes ago, and we threw up a poll on our Twitter, <laughs> and we asked fans of this podcast. Of this so it podcast. might be a little skewed. Uh, who had a bigger impact on professional wrestling? And we put it up there, Mick Foley or Sting. I'm happy to say, Mick, you got 62.7%. that's our show. That's we had Sting retweet it. Not really. Not really. Not really. <laughs> now, did you ask uh, Tony and EB what their, about their take on that? Uh, they picked Sting. Yeah. Yeah. That's the right pick. But they were WCW guys. Look, Sting had a huge impact on my career. The chances of, so we're doing a whole show about it. Yes. And there'll be plenty to talk about. Yes. Um, if Sting were given the opportunity to do a show about me, it would be a shorter show because I did not have nearly the impact. Sting helped make me, I provided a little boost of energy to Sting along the way. And this is how, I, you know, Sting, I think, has been pretty open about his, uh, I guess he had issues that I did not know about that were not, issues when I was there. It talk, yeah. uh, he, has he talked about that? I don't yes, know. it's out there. Uh, um, so he he doesn't recollect some of the things, uh, which is surprising, and really, uh, you know, an admoni ad <laughs> admonition, is that the right word? Admonish? Uh, a warning about people who want to tinker with those things. You lose your memory. That's a, I've been hit a lot. In short term, I have issues, but long term, I've got these amazing memories about staying. I just thought it was really unusual that stuff that is in my head right. that I can recall so readily, Sting might not know because of that time period where he fell into trouble. Well, how do you reconcile that? Because I've always been fascinated by that with you because sometimes we'll come in here and I'll start a story and man, you know what you wrote word for yeah. word. You remember every little detail about these stories. But, for instance, the reason we call Dave Silva, the man behind the camera, Grillo, is the first several times you met him, you forgot his name. Right. And, and well, I, I find it fascinating that the short term and long term seemingly are way different. They are way different. Why is it's, that? Do I think? don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, we, I, I will make it a point 
to research that reason, maybe put a call into Chris Nowinski. But I do know that I was really struggling. I know this isn't the subject of the no, show, but there was, a, there was a time where I was really having trouble, you know, where the people talk about a muted feeling, almost like being underwater, where I would just wake up. And I think I touched on this in my A&E biography that was out a couple of years ago, where I would wake up and just be like, I would know this day doesn't even have the potential to be good. It's just this feeling, it's, ah, just that's underwater feeling. You have it for so long, that becomes like the new normal. And then it's what I, so I realized I'm having trouble here. So in 2012, 2013, when I was doing the one man shows, there was really a sense of urgency because I felt like I was in a bad place memory wise, you know, um, Mood wise, just in that, it wasn't like I was throwing things around the house. I never got angry or anything like that, but it was just really hard to get out of that doldrums. And uh, and in my case, I think it was directly related to the concussions. So uh, some time goes by. I see uh, Chris Nowinski at my show in Boston. He asks me how I'm doing. I said, Chris, I said, this is crazy, but I'm feeling a lot better than I was. And he said, Mick, that's because what you're doing on that stage is the best form of exercise for your brain. I said, really? He goes, well, look, you're, you're working on stories, you're, you're memorizing some stories, and you're playing off the crowd. He said, it's like doing gymnastics for your brain. And I think I, I've taken on enough things that keep me, that keep my brain exercised. Sure. The show being one of them, um, the, uh, the cameos being another, uh, the one man shows, I'm not going to go out on the road with those for, uh, another year and a half, but even the conventions, you know, where you're having, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're entertaining a sense. You're trying to create a moment for people, yes. not just an autograph. You're trying to make them feel special. And all of those things I think, uh, are really helpful for my brain. I do have some things where I can't remember. Like I'll go to a commercial, there'll be like a commercial break and, I, and then I'll think, like last night I was watching Law & Order SVU, one of my go-to shows when, when you're really, traveling, in a, you're traveling in a hotel and they go to commercial break and I just had to really think, what did I just watch? What did I just see? And then I have to try to piece it together. So I do struggle with that. But as far as the long term, yeah, I feel really like it's a gift to have these strong all these great memories in vivid and be able to recall them vividly. I know we're sidebarring here, but I don't think you maybe having that moment watching TV is that big a deal. Like I, I think a lot of us, myself included, we've all been driving and we sort of zone out and, and we're you, not really thinking about, you couldn't driving. even tell what the last, did song I stop at the at. red light? <laughs> did I, did I, I don't remember going through that stop sign, but you're just sort of in automatic, I don't yeah. know why that why our brains work the way they do. Maybe we just should have a whiskey <laughs> on sometime. But I just find it fascinating that you remember such great detail, but then something innocuous that was more recent, it's like gone. Yeah, now. yeah, gone. exactly. Uh, well, something that's not gone is the legacy Sting leaves behind. And listen, we had a little fun with our Twitter poll, but we also had some comments and some questions uh, from folks who voted, uh, like our old pal uh, John. He says, this is really tough. I'd say it's almost comparable. Sting was bigger longer and worked with Hogan, but Mick worked with the top talent during the hottest point in wrestling, Taker, Kane, Austin, Triple H, Rock. Do you think Sting working with Hogan gives him separation? No, I don't think I you, don't either. I don't. That's it's interesting, but I don't think that elevate. I'm not, that's not knocking Hogan. I'm just saying, like, the fact that you came along and, and worked with Hulk, I'd be hard-pressed to tell you what that angle was. Doesn't stand out as being a the the, the Sting Hogan. One? Yeah, it was the NWO Crow Sting. That was huge. Oh, okay, my bad. That's okay. You weren't watching. <laughs> and in fairness, Sting didn't do much. That's when we had brooding Sting in yeah. the rafters. Yeah, he'd come down and point, but he wasn't cutting promos. It wasn't right. traditional wrestling stuff. Uh, Jason brings up a great point. He says it's apples and oranges. They were both great and had a great impact, but for different reasons at different times. That's probably a fair assessment. Yeah, huh? yeah. Uh, Eric says, Mick's book, Have a Nice Day, showed a side of the business and its talent that we hadn't seen before. It had a significant impact on how wrestlers were perceived outside of the ring. The book's success also impacted how advertisers saw the brand. 
I think it's interesting that even when we're talking about the impact on wrestling, we don't just talk about the things we saw on the screen. Eric yeah. points out, hey, there's more to it than that. It's an excellent point. I am open to any observations that make me look more important than I actually was. Uh, Tigers at the aquarium would write, uh, I'd be interested to see this pose to Mick and Sting because I get the sense they both go out of their way to put each other over. They both contributed so much during their prime. Sting definitely was more of the franchise guy, but Foley had so many great moments too. I think it's the perfect button to put on that discussion. So let's just go. I like it. Yeah, I like it. Uh, of course, Sting's career began on the independence teaming with the ultimate warrior. I think, as I understand it, he starts a little powerlifting team out there with uh, Mr. Rick Bassman out in California and eventually makes his way over to Memphis, sees Jerry Jarrett, and here we go. I remember uh, the comment from Sting said, Jerry, uh, or, or no, Jerry, after, after this short lived uh, experience in Memphis, uh, at that time, promoters would be on the phone with each other. Yes. And, uh, and Jerry t- tells Sting that Bill Watts likes the big guys. Like, you know, like you don't have, like this isn't working out perfectly here. Here's another place you can go. Watts loves the big guys. So Sting went, Warrior went elsewhere, right? Warrior went. No, Sting went to Watts for a minute. Sting went to Watts. But oh, did, you, did Warrior go to Watts though? He did. He did, okay. They were a tag team there for just a hiccup, just okay. a cup of coffee. And, and then when the split happened, because if you recall, Crockett acquired Watts. Right. And rather than stick around, Warrior went to world class. Did he, he left because of the split or before that? Before the split. And he went to world class. Yes. Right? And yes. He, as the dingo warrior. And Sting was really in a great position to learn. And I would say, you know... He was, I was, I was privy to the uh, Bill Watts' Mid South tapes at that time, and so you could see him yes. under the tutelage, really, from Eddie Gilbert. Absolutely, Eddie Gilbert was a huge uh, influence on Sting, and showcased him in such a way that people in WCW could see the dollar signs and potential in him. And then when Rick, more or less, I mean, we talk about making someone yes. in one, I believe it was a 48-minute match, or was it a 60-minute? They minute? called it a 45-minute time limit draw. Okay. But the very first Clash of the Champions, head-to-head with WrestleMania IV, uh, on free TV, record rating of all the people, Rick wanted to work with Sting, and Sting was a made man after that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's no... I always say your big break is a series of... Little breaks, uh, and so Sting had had his little breaks, culminating yes with this like coming out party yes. So there's a new star in town, and he became at that point, along with Rick, and Luger, like the basically the foundation for WCW for the next several years. Great stuff, and uh, of course, it's always fun to think about. Hey, what if? You know, what if the Ultimate Warrior and Sting were to switch places and Sting goes to world class and somehow Warrior winds up in Crockett? I don't know that it would have shaken out the way it did, but I'm glad it worked out the way it did. I am too. I also want to mention when you were talking about that six man, or you were actually talking about Eddie Gilbert, the the, the other guy who rounded out that group was Rick Steiner. And to think about a very young Rick Steiner and a very young Sting, and we already know Eddie Gilbert had a mind for the business at that point. That trio right there, imagine if they could have kept that together long-term. Man, that thing could have been crazy, huh? Yeah, and Rick Steiner was another guy who you could see growing by the week. So when I first became aware of Rick Steiner, it's because Shane Douglas and Brian Hildebrandt slash Mark Curtis point out the bumps this guy was taking when he was considered enhancement talent. Right. And one of the things he did, for example, when he took a cross body that just off the top rope that looked fantastic. And we kept trying to figure out what looks so good about it. And Brian goes, take a look. Rick's already kind of in the air. He's kind of jumping up a little bit as he takes the impact. And so the result was, it wasn't, you know, usually, boom, you take cross body and it's not a crisp bump. It's almost like a rolling bump. Yes. And Rick Steiner would take it as a crisp bump, and it looked fantastic. So here was a guy with the great college pedigree, yes. not yet a character, not yet the dog-faced gremlin, 
but he's attracting eyeballs because of the way he's putting guys over. So Eddie Gilbert sees that, puts him in there, and yeah, yeah, that was a nice that was a nice group he had going there. So, so for you, the, I'm just sorry to talk over you. So just imagine the the two guys, young, hungry guys, different reasons. Yes. Sting comes from a bodybuilding background. Uh, Rob Rick Steiner, Rick Steiner comes from uh, amateur wrestling background. They both have so much to learn about professional wrestling, and they do it on a nightly basis with Eddie, who we dedicated a whole episode to yeah. four or five months ago. Phenomenal stuff. And I guess that, that would have been the first time you saw Sting, right? You wouldn't have seen the Memphis stuff, but you saw the Watts stuff. Exactly. Uh, he had the look, man. You know, he's muscular. Uh, he's got the bright colored hair. He just looks like a wrestler. And as we know, Watts' territory is going to be purchased by Jim Crockett Promotions. Uh, Sting going one-on-one -on -one at the Clash of the Champions is just a star-making moment. And when you think about, because you said it earlier, you know, Sting helped make me. When we talk about a guy making a guy, is that the top of the list? Like when you think of that phrase, oh, he made a guy. Flair making Sting in that first Clash of the Champions, that might be the best example in the history of wrestling. No? Uh, yeah, I would say you'd be hard-pressed to find a better example. Yeah. Maybe there's an equal example out there. But in one night, overnight, making a star, I can't think of a better. Can I break protocol here? Please do. Grillo, any way I can get a second rock energy drink? I uh, I finished this. And may I point out, uh, Grillo, uh, we can keep rolling, right? Uh I, I mentioned I, I had the sniffles, you know, which uh, you get when you do a lot of traveling. Asked for a tissue, and our show being what it is, Grillo doesn't just bring me a tissue. He brings me an entire roll. We get shit paper. done around here. <laughs> That's what we like to say. <laughs> Grillo over Ah, let me see. Which one did I just have? We had fruit punch, and then we have the white peach. The white peach. Let me go white peach for my struggling friend, Dwayne Johnson. Uh, Taz on his old podcast would call this water break Jones, but I guess now we are energy drink Jones here on the program. Uh, of course, listen, we could talk about sting all day long. Let's talk about your interactions with sting. Yeah. You have an interaction with sting on your second night in WCW in 1989. Uh, but it's not really followed up uh, during your first run. You this Go ahead. Go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead and read it. You wrote in your book, the next night we worked at the Dorton Arena in Raleigh where I had my first singles match with a talented young wrestler on the rise named Flying Brian Pillman. I went a full eight minutes with Brian, and we turned out a match that was excellent in quality and intensity. Terry Funk was doing the color commentary on the show, and if you listen closely, you can hear the Funker's admiration shining through. I lost the contest but refused to leave the ring and was still there when Sting came out for the match. Being the hero to the little stingers that he was, Sting didn't take too kindly to my poor show of sportsmanship and proceeded to beat me all around ringside, including a backdrop over the guardrail that had the Dorton Arena fans ooing and eyeing in unison. Despite the fact that I had been both beaten and beaten up, <laughs> I was on cloud nine when I got to the dressing room because I knew I had done well. Minutes later, Funk, Sullivan, and even Buzz Sawyer were congratulating me on the match. Your second night in the company, rubbing yeah. elbows with the top guy, man. man. Sting, come yeah. on. Yeah, I could not have been happier. Like I said, just lost the match and was beaten up. Uh, I would follow that up by doing the same thing at the Clash of the Champions with Moscaris. I lose the match to Moscaris, then got beaten up by Wolf Wild, the drummer of the house band. Not quite the same. Not quite the same thing. Uh, yeah, I really was on cloud nine, and that seemed to open up... Um, some eyes as to what I might be able to do. And, uh, and also the, I think they realized early on, Hey, this guy's got the, I had the proponents there. I had corny, I had Sullivan, uh, that the, the ability to take cool looking big bumps is a benefit can really benefit a top guy, even if it's not a program, even if it's just that one off. And I believe that was the only interaction I had with Sting. There may have been others had Sting not been hurt. So uh, the day, the the night, uh, two days after that match in Dorton Arena, um, I was in a bad car accident. Right. So I, I wrestled uh, did the, uh, with Nasty Ned Brady, owner of some of the best facial expressions in all of wrestling. And a great, when I say underneath, you, that's meant as a, uh, as a compliment. You know, we need 
underneath talent, just like we need top talent. Uh, I turned on him after our match, dropped the big elbow. That was the night of the the bang bang. First time bang bang came, and 24 hours later, I'm in an emergency room, uh, bleeding, you know, badly from several places uh, due to a car accident. Uh, and Sting, I think early February at a Wild Thing, not no, not the Wild Thing pay per view, but probably the clash that followed. Uh, destroyed his patellar tendon and was out for six, eight months. Yeah, it, it totally changed the timeline of yeah. what was possible. And I actually wanted to ask you about that because after your first run in WCW comes to an end, you had worked with saying they had not yet anointed him like the top guy. They hadn't made him the champ or anything. I mean, he's clearly, you know, one of the big he, baby faces. He was the top baby face. So, uh, and there was no one even close right. to the point where when Sting went down with that patellar injury, Luger was pressed back into babyface action only about By seven. necessity, yeah. Yeah, and this was seven months after the big heel turn with uh, Harley. And uh, we've talked on the show about uh, the, mul- the turns become a case of diminishing returns. Uh that you really, I feel, have one good turn in each company that you work for, unless you're working for a long period of time. But even then, I, the first turn means the most. Right. And Luger, who was having a nice a nice run as a heel, is forced out of necessity to become uh, the top babyface. And I wrote an article about three, four years ago called Reexamining Lex Luger. Yes. Even though I knew that I could have more people watching it if I did a two-minute video, I wanted people to be able to feel the work that went into an article. It's a good size article. It takes four, six hours, between four and six hours to write. And I wanted people to feel that when I talked about Luger and how he, he should be looked at again and yes. considered for the WWE Hall of Fame because I was on hand on a nightly basis when he and Rick, Ric Flair would just tear the house down. And the, you could say, well, that's Rick. It's like, yeah, but it does take, it takes two to tango. No doubt. You know, and Luger, he may have been being led by Rick, but he was really, I thought, really good in that role. And uh, the 42 minute match they did in Greensboro, I believe it was, or it was maybe, it was Rick's 42nd birthday. It may have been a 48 minute match, but it was a spectacular pay-per-view match, a great match, and they had great matches on a nightly basis because Nature Boy doesn't have nights off, you right. know? Like, you don't go in and just go through the motions. Every night's going to be a, a, a match of epic proportions. So I know we're talking about Sting, but... Um, but so I, Lex Luger's a big part of Sting. Big part of Sting's career. I um, I consider Lex Luger a friend. We've mm-hmm. we've hung out a few times, and, of course, I've had him at several star casts, and he's just... A fantastic human being. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me say this. If you have an opportunity to, to meet Lex Luger, he's at an autograph thing or a convention thing, go out of your way to meet him. Yeah. But I do want to say I have a theory as to why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Okay. I just want your opinion on I think it's because he needs a little more help getting around, and I don't remember there being a wheelchair on stage for a Hall of Fame, and I don't think that that's maybe the light that Vince wanted to be shown on wrestling, and maybe he thought that was a bad thing for wrestling, and it was a whatever. But I just know that, in my opinion, he would have already been in the Hall of Fame. I don't think it's a debate as to whether or not he's his career was worthy of the Hall of Fame. No disrespect to the folks who were in, but I think you and I would both agree there are some folks we would have put Lex Luger in and before them, perhaps. Yeah. But I just think it's the wheelchair thing. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's right. I'm just saying I think... That's maybe why he hasn't already gotten that invite. I speculated, and I even talked to Mr. McMahon about this, um, and I, we covered this conversation about the weight loss. You did not bring the scale, did you? I did not. Ah! Ah! I was focused on a separate request oh. this time. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the toilet paper? The, the wardrobe. The, oh, yes. I mean, those are, those are not my recycled clothes. Those are brand new clothes from a store. Like, I went to the store. So in my haste to finish grilling Jr. this morning, I was like, I gotta get to the store before Foley pulls up. He drove eight hours. So you got a new wardrobe and a bag. Here's the so. thing, I, I, uh, I travel light. Yes, you do. 
So the 19 inch carry on bag or the computer bag gets me through sometimes two week trips. Yes. If I don't have a chance to do laundry a couple times, then I'm running on fumes yes. as far as the wardrobe goes. <laughs> so well, Columbia should be a new sponsor because you have uh, a whole variety <laughs> okay. of, of new shirts. Here's the thing, though. I do have the scale, and I will bring the scale tomorrow. Okay. So as you know, with peek behind the curtain, we're recording tomorrow. So. We're recording to Yeah, we're recording tomorrow. Okay, so we'll do the weigh-in yes. for next week's show. Yes. So I, th I think I mentioned that I, I, I called Vince. At Kevin Dunn's request, said Vince really, he, I didn't know that he he likes to have relationships with the people he thinks helped really helped the company. And Kevin Dunn said he's got that with Steve, he's got that with Rock, he's got that with Taker, he's got that with Paul, he doesn't have that with you. So uh, I texted him, I said, hey, do you want to talk on the phone? He said, yes. And so we talked the next day. And I said, you know, this has never been substantiated, but it's my guess that the reason I'm rarely on TV is because it's hard to watch me get around. This is pre, uh, pre hip, or hip and knee replacement. And he didn't, he didn't yet say yes or no, but I said, I just want you to know, I've already dropped 20 pounds. I'm looking at dropping 80 by the holidays. And he said, I'm going to hold you to that. And that was such a motivating force for me, which I don't have now, which is why we need to do yes. the weight loss challenge because I put on all that weight I lost plus a few pounds. But that was my speculation then, that uh, this going back to the Luger, yeah. uh, uh, the Luger subject, is that Mr. McMahon wants to take people away from everyday Yes problems he really believes in that power of telling stories and allowing people to uh escape real life for a few hours at a time and then become really frustrated about something that's not real life you know right. which we sometimes do but some, sometimes there's great moments and they make up for all the frustration and they remind you just often enough why you fell in love to begin with right absolutely um but i would say there might be something to that there might be well, I hope he goes in sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think he has anything wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying. I wish Vader could have been on that stage for himself, not just Hanson. And I did ask. Yeah. I asked. I said he's got two uh, two years to live. And I said to him, "We know he's going to get in sooner or later. I'd like it to be sooner." Yes. And that request wasn't. You know, I don't go to events very often, but that sure. was a big one for me, and I had tears in my eyes. And for whatever reason, that call wasn't made until later. But I do agree with you as far as the, the shows. Lex is, uh, he's really humble. One he of the is, nicest men of all time. Yeah, I mean, he's very religious. Yes. Uh, he has a great um, attitude. Yes. He lo and he loves being at those shows. Yes, he does. He loves having the chance, whereas in his prime. Maybe not. He, maybe not. And now he do, he does. He's not just in it for the the the, the, the payoff. Uh, he's a good guy. Tony Hunter does. I think yep. he does. Tony's a good guy. I mean, I I consider Tony a friend. He's not my booking agent, but he he has a good crew of guys there. Yes, he does. And uh, and he's so so Lex is around frequently. And if you have a chance, go uh, go 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 see him. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, we were talking about how Sting was. You know, when you're leaving, he's not yet crowned. The world champ. I mean, he is the top baby face, yeah. but WCW is several steps down below the WWF at this time. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, uh, before, you know, after your first WCW run, before Sting is crowned world champ and they're really getting behind him as the top guy, did you think Sting, ne Sting needed to leave in order to level up? Did you think he needed to go to the WWF? I'm saying before he was ever crowned, like in 89, in early 90. Was it in your mind, he's doing well here, but boy, if he was with Vince. No, I never once had that feeling. Okay. Uh, I Over the years, people have wondered about staying and you know whether he would have had a classic series of matches with Undertaker. Yes. Because of the darkness of the uh, ring, you know, the second incarnation of the Sting. <laughs> Whoa, sorry about that. Um, I just think about Sting in that era, like, because... Flair has talked about this a lot, that Sting could have been a much bigger star had he went to work with Vince and had that marketing machine behind him. And I think about him during that uh, you know, new generation era, 
the British Bulldog, mm-hmm. Diesel, Razor Ramon, Shawn Michaels, the One Two Three Kid, Bret Hart. Man, that could have been so- Sting and Yokozuna. Man, that could have been awesome. It could have been awesome. And uh, one of the drawbacks I know as somebody in WCW trying to move up that ladder yes. was, uh, and I've mentioned this on my live shows, is that the conundrum that WCW was in was that you couldn't become a top guy unless you were making top guy money. There you go. But you couldn't make top guy money unless you were a top guy. So they did kind of work themselves into a situation where there were a limited number of people on top and they kept rehashing feuds yes. within that limited number of people. So yeah, uh, going to WWE, now that you mention it, may have been an amazing move for him. But that's, but WWE has always been a roll of the dice. Yes. You don't know, like you take a guy, I'm just thinking Dick Slater was a guy who, you know, who was a solid hand, a really good worker. Everywhere he went, he did well. Gets to WWE, done, done. Don't even get me talking about Don Carnoodle, right? right? I think he was there for a heartbeat. I don't think Sting would have fallen into that, but you you never know. Right. You never know. My own career, like, if you would have rolled the dice, you would have thought, the chances of Vince McMahon pushing this guy right. well, let alone as one of his top guys, are. Uh, You're lucky you showed up when you did. You could have been Duke the dumpster dressed. I know, brother. I know because right. some people Theo could Hopper. want to look at the mankind uh, gimmick and thought that that was the death knell. And uh, I remember, you know, the feedback was overwhelmingly negative uh, among a certain s- subset of. Die-hard wrestling fans. I mean, with anybody else, The Undertaker could have been PN News or RoboCop, you know, but, <laughs> but Mr. Calloway made it work. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. And that's a testament to you guys. Um, you know, the, 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 the saying in the wrestling business for a long time, and you hear about this a lot in 96, when Kevin Nash and Scott Hall are talking about jumping ship from the WWF to WCW, is they want to make what's known as sting money. Sting money, that's right, yeah. Do you remember hearing that phrase, sting money? Yeah, yeah, I do, because that was the top echelon. I don't know what kind of deal Rick worked out uh, and whether he was making the same money as Sting when he came back. Sting was, I mean, I think it was three-quarters of a million. We're talking about, uh, this is 25, 30 years ago. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it was, that, was the top, that was top guy money there, the top guy money at the time. Um, when you make your return in 91, you're immediately programmed with him. Was this a surprise to you? Or, I mean, did you know right away I'm coming in and I'm just going to be fed and then I'm moving on? Or no. What you I knew I was going to be working with Sting. The whole feeding angle was not brought up to me. So I think we might be jumping ahead a little bit. You've got two guys being told two different things. I see. Sting being told he, he, there's a series of of guys coming in to put you over and move on in rapid succession. Like Hogan in the 80s. Yeah, and me thinking that I'm here for a full-time job. Right. Um, And it results in the only tense moment I've ever had with Sting. And that moment came about when uh, I get called into action to work main events with Sting on house shows because Nikita Koloff... (laughs) <laughs> it just sounds so silly. Doesn't want to lose on non-televised house shows. I, I like. I'm sorry. You know, like I, I still to this day you'll run into. You let Grillo beat you in the parking lot before you came in. <laughs> you couldn't care less. You just said, "Hook the leg, brother." Did Have I mention that I lost to Wolf Wild after losing to Moscus? So it just it seems silly to quit a company over not wanting to lose to the top guy at house shows. Yes. Uh, but that was, you know, that was Nikita's decision, and uh, I was called into action, thinking that I am in WCW as a full time guy, and now I'm in main events with uh, Sting. And Sting goes, "Do you have any ideas?" I think this is the Meadowlands. Uh, and I think it's July of 91. Uh, August of 91 is when we shoot the angle uh, at Clash of the Champions, I think. I may be off by a month here, all the thir- over 30 years down the road. Um, 
And so Sting says, hey, you got any ideas? And, <laughs> and I did refer to this when I did the 20 years of hell where I could be locked in, you know, like character wise. And the one thing that leaving WCW, not the one thing, but of the many things uh, that I learned, one of them was like to believe in myself, you know, to have that self-confidence, to think that I dare stand, you know, be able to hold my own with these top of the card guys. And so when Sting says, do you have any ideas? I was like, oh, I've got a lot of ideas. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, it'd be so good to work with somebody who's got new ideas. And I start laying these ideas out and I see Sting's eyes getting <laughs> wider and wider. And he goes, and this is the only, I hesitate to tell the story only because the expression might make look sting, what he said might make him look bad, but keep in mind, he's only coming from the place that he's been told yes. exists. So he's, one of many. Yeah, he goes, so you expect Sting to go 50-50? He goes, he said, I thought you were just here to put me over. And I, so I think, well, yeah, I'm here, like Meadowlands, <laughs> to put you over. I don't know I'm supposed to be here for six weeks and gone. Um, so when he said, you expect Sting to go 50-50, I was like, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I'd be locked in. And I could see a little bit of the trepidation, you know. You see the wheel spinning. Uh, like. uh, yeah. So I said, I'll tell you what. This is one of the best bargains I ever struck in wrestling. I said, what if we go out there and do what I suggest for the first few minutes and if you don't like it, we'll do whatever you want. And uh, I get I get in those those tingles right there because we went out there, and uh, after five, <laughs> five minutes, things are things are going really well. And there was never ever there was there was never a contention. And the only other contention was that he thought maybe at a certain point the character was uh, Cactus Jack was getting too sympathetic. And that's this is before we did um, Bash at the Beach. The uh, uh, I know I'm jumping around here, and that's when I laid out my feeling that the bad seed may have a certain amount of heat, but the child who makes the conscious decision to be bad gets more heat than the person who's bad to begin with. Yes. Uh, the the teach as and I said the teacher will have her heart broken by the student she tries so hard to work with who turn who turns out not to live up to her expectations as opposed to the bad kid. And then I also laid out what at the time was, uh, uh, in the movies, uh, at that time was um, Cape Fear with Robert De Niro. Yes. And there's this great scene where Nick Nolte, who is the baby face, yes. has hired a hitman. No, they're not there to kill him, but uh, uh, was it Joe Don Baker or one of those other character actors who says, uh, I got some boys with some ball bearings, <laughs> baseball bat, bicycle chain. And so Nick Nolte is behind the dumpster listening in, and he just knows he, you know, his problem is going to be taken care of. And then he sees and hears the heel valiantly fighting the odds and overcoming them to the point where De Niro gives his uh, his great line, counselor, come out, come out, wherever you are. So the heel is here, he's battered, bleeding, but unbowed. The baby face is cowering behind a, be, uh, behind a dumpster. And at that point, you don't know who the baby face or the heel is yes. until De Niro's character's further actions establish him yes. as a horrible human being. But a horrible human being can still have some redeeming qualities. Redeeming qualities. And that was so, so that was the only other even minor point of contention. But it was, just, it was so much fun to go out there. And they weren't long matches. They were about eight or nine. They were uh, shorter than 10 minutes around the horn. But they were really, really filled with action, and it was it was a different type of opponent for Sting, and um, and this is one of my favorite stories, partially because I get to do a Dusty Rose imitation. And the thing is, it might not even be a hundred percent factually correct, 
But my recollection of it is that I was giving these promos in uh, the, the uh, first floor of the CNN Center with Diamond Dallas Page as the, he was the producer. This is pre-wrestling DDP. DDP had been one of Dusty's right-hand men uh, from Florida Championship Wrestling. So Dallas is listening to the promos. When I would go in there, I wouldn't have the one promo I would do and extend. You know, Bruce tells that great story about yes. Randy Savage doing it. And Randy, one of the great promo guys. But on this day, you know, that was the idea. You have one basic promo, and when it was 30 seconds, you go, oh, yeah, thinking, thinking, thinking. When it was one minute, it was, oh, yeah, thinking, thinking, thinking. So you stretch it out. Yes. When I came in, I had all these ideas, and I was just throwing stuff at the wall, and a lot of it was sticking. So that when I said, Sting, you know what? I was having trouble falling asleep last night. Over the years, Mankind and Cactus kind of morphed into the same, you know, similar, very similar voice. But I said, I was trying, I couldn't fall asleep, so I started counting all of the ways that I could do bodily harm to you. I fell asleep at 1,733, and I hadn't even gotten to your legs yet. And so, so I got a good pop from Grillo. And there were just all the little songs I would come out with. So legend has it that DDP at, on that day went up to the eighth floor, ninth floor, and told Dusty Rhodes, Dream, you got to check this guy out. And the next thing I know, and I don't know if it's the same day or a different day, and my telling is the same day, Dusty's down in that little studio and he's bigger than life. He's got Stetson hat. I don't think he had eight band-aids on his head because I think he hadn't he hadn't wrestled in a while. But he's got the button down shirt. He's dusty, you know, and he's listening silently, listening silently to the first couple promos. And then he walks up to me, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, I think we're gonna keep you around here for a little while. So I had no inclination that I wasn't going to be around anyway. Right. Uh, I was simultaneously working with Sting while I was losing on global championship, global uh, Joe Pettisino's global wrestling because I didn't have a contract, you right. know. And then there's the the talk I had with Magnum where I was offered the seventy five grand, and Magnum said it's just a carrot, you know. Next year, you know, we won fifty, and I looked at him. I said, Magnum, you've seen me wrestle. There might not be a next year. <laughs> That's the way I felt, you know. And you got it. Uh, and I got it. I mean, I got the one, the 150, and uh, we were off to the races, and the table was set for the big angle. Uh, not only the big angle with Sting, but the teaming of uh, my Cactus Jack character with Abdullah the Butcher, which was bigger and better than probably it would have looked on paper. Well, something that looks great on paper and in real life, <laughs> our friends at Henson Shaving. Oh, yeah. It's a razor you and I have fallen in love with. It truly is a razor that will last you a lifetime. And I have to admit, before I actually ordered one, because they do send us something to vet, and we got to try it, I loved it. Yeah. But I was shocked when I convinced my dad to go buy one how affordable it was. And I'm not going to say how much it costs here, but I will say it was a whole heck of a lot less than I expected mm -hmm. because I had heard that the blades only cost three to $5 a year and me being a salesman, Mick, I thought, okay, so that must mean the razor is really expensive. It's not. it's not, it's a razor that will last you a lifetime. And you heard me blades are just three to $5. Can a I year. just interject? You know what I love most about it? What's that? No planned obsolescence. There you go. There. I mean, seriously, there's no plastic. There's no subscriptions. There's no gimmicks. These guys wanted to create the best razor, not just the best razor business. And that's why we believe in Henson shaving. They're family owned and they're really an aerospace parts manufacturer that somehow got into the razor game. Yeah. But before this, these folks were making stuff for the Mars Rover and the international space station. And now they use those same aerospace grade CNC machines to make metal razors that extend just 0 0.0013 inches. That's less than the thickness of a human hair. Now here's why that matters. You see, razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble. The more the wobble, the more nicks, cuts, and scrapes. You see, a bad shave isn't a blade problem. It's an extension problem. So not only does Henson make the thinnest razors around, 
And they also have built-in channels to evacuate hair and cream. So it makes clogging virtually impossible. It's like old school feel with all the benefits of new school tech because it's a standard dual edge razor blade, but it's 0.0013 inches. And you heard me a year's worth is just three to $5. Yeah. Come on now. Let's say no to subscriptions. Let's say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Hurry to hensonshavingcom slash Foley and pick up the razor for you and use the promo code Foley and you'll get two years worth of blades for free. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head over to H E N S O N S H A V I N G dot com slash Foley and use the promo code Foley, Henson Shaving dot com slash Foley. I know this sounds crazy, but I've taken to mine, not in the last couple of weeks because I've been on the road. Uh, and when you're traveling with the uh, just the carry on, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to put the razor in there. Yes. Right? Uh, so I will. Uh, uh, I, uh, when I get home, I'll, I'll clean up. I actually enjoy it to the point where my shaving system has become like a friend, to the point where I even gave him a name. Uh, really? Yeah, Ramon. Yes. Razor so, Ramon. Well, Ramon Razor. Oh, of course. Ramon. The, the other one was trademarked. <laughs> You're right. Hensonshaving.com <laughs> forward slash. That's a me. long way to go for very little. You know what? You made it work. <laughs> I knew where it was going, and I just couldn't stop it. It's like Jordan in the 80s. I can only hope to contain it. As long as you're talking about shaving, it's been many months since I talked about my own a beard oil, right? The oh, full yeah, Yeti. That? And the, I, what I do is uh, when I go to the conventions and I see uh, part of my bearded brethren, I will get, let them sample it. And it's there's so much in the way of men's products. It's all really woodsy as if to yes. say, like, oh, I'm a man. And my feeling is... Dude, if I have to prove my manhood, I've got like 200 hours of VHS tapes you yeah. can watch. I like that minty tingle that the Foglietti from Mythical Beards provides me. So in conjunction with your shaving system, get that tingle at mythicalbeards.com. Hey, while we're talking about uh, all this fabulous footage of you doing ultra manly stuff, <laughs> there's some footage that was recently Academy Award nominated. Oh, yeah, that's right. And in this movie, they're actually talking about you and The Undertaker <laughs> and the Hell in a Cell. Is that surreal? <laughs> it was so surreal. So I, I did put out a post uh, putting The Rock over. Batista is fabulous in Knock on the Crushed Cat. Crushed it. He's just so good. You forget he was... Batista. You do. He yes. really, he's got the benefit of being escape, to able to escape into these very different roles. The Rock's larger than life. The Rock is the Rock in every movie. The Rock, yeah, and he's amazing. This is not Batista. Yeah, this is Batista. He's really become this amazing A-list character actor. Yes, it's, yes. It's really incredible what he does. And uh, Kevin Nash, our friend Kevin, has there ever been a better Seven foot tall exotic dancer. He's the, the best movies. in history. He is the Bret Hart of seven foot tall. Number one. <laughs> exotic dancers. Uh, and the, so I did hear in a comment, I read a comment on social media mentioning this book, all, this movie, All That Breathes, nominated for an Academy Award for documentary. So I watched it with my mom. And I know that my name is going to be mentioned, but I have no idea in what context. And it's this beautiful movie about these two brothers, I think they're brothers, from India. And that they, they've dedicated a large part of their lives to rescuing injured kite birds. They're called kite birds because they seem to fly so effortlessly, like a kite. And they've been dropping from the sky in Delhi uh, because of the poor air quality. Wow. So these two guys, they make it there. It's, it's like their life's work to rehabilitate these birds. And there's this scene where they're in their garage. Uh, I think they're bathing one of the birds, and they're talking about Hell in a Cell. And it's crazy. It shows up in the su subtitles, and it's like the one where he was choked, he was thrown off the cage. And the other guy goes, he was choke slammed through it. Uh, the whole ring broke, and they say stunning. And it was like, this is, yeah, it was it was surreal. It you, was, never, you never know how it's going to impact somebody. Uh, all the way on the other end of the world in another language. It's crazy. Yeah. So I was I was rooting for it. I had heard that the... Now, what the, did they say about Sting in this movie? He wasn't even in it. Yeah. He's, he wasn't in a single Oscar Academy Award nominated film. Solidified 
okay. are voting on. And yeah. listen, this might be the sound bite of the show. Okay. I'm not trying to get controversy, but, but if it causes controversy, so be it. I believe the song contest in the early 1990s was rigged because I refuse to believe that a man called Sting was better than Mr. Bang Bang. These songs, it, it, I, it's in my head. He does this. He does that. He's big as an ox and quick as a cat. Yes. The man called Sting. Not good. No, nah, I didn't think it was good. And they had one of the members of Leonard Skinner listening, and he was like, that's the one. And I thought, that's fake. Wrestling itself, not fake. That L- contest. Leonard Skinner thinking, that's the winner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what were the lyrics of Mr. Bang Bang? He's not on a team or a member of a gang. He's Cactus Jack, or better known as Mr. Bang Bang. Has has anybody referred to you as Mr. Bang Bang? Never, not once. Um, well, <laughs> Blue Chew's a sponsor here in a little bit. I just thought of a transition. Uh, listen, I found uh, my first match I could find in my research of you and Sting was you teaming with Arn Anderson, Kevin Sullivan, and the One Man Gang to lose to this crew. It's Barry Windham, Elegante, Sting, and the Yellow Dog Brian Pillman in a War Games match in Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. Your first time in the ring with Sting in an official match. Uh-huh. War Games? Come on. Pretty uh, cool. uh, what, what date was that? Uh, I don't have the date in front of me. I know it's 91, and I know I, a week so... later you're w- with him in the Meadowlands, and that's your oh, first all right, okay, match. So, all right, okay, so I stand corrected. But that was a result of the call-off. Yes. That was supposed to be. I'm Nikita. sure it was originally a call-off in your stand yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah, I was quite a crew to be in there with. And to be in the war games in a main event, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty special. Elegante, where does he rank on your list of favorite opponents? He's in that lower. Any good Elegante <laughs> stories? I'm sorry. Have you heard Jim Ross tell his Elegante no, story? I don't, I don't know. He was trying to get Elegante to do promos about Ric Flair. Yeah. And it's taped, of course. It's recorded. So they're ready. Okay, action. Ric Flair, I kill you. <laughs> Cut. All right. L, you can't say I kill you. You got you can't say kill. So let's try this. Let's try that. There's a cat. Whatever. So they come back. Okay. Ric Flair, I kill you. That was the end of promo class. Jim Ross and Elegante. I, George, as I hear it, was a super nice man. I never had the chance to meet him. You did. Yeah. he. I, he, I didn't get to know him well because of the language bar- barrier. Uh, I asked Tony Schiavone what he remembered of Elegante, and he said well, it was like a roll of bologna. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't know but, I do know, uh, I don't want to name names, but whoever was responsible for securing the, the largest Cadillac I believe may have had three or four of them out simultaneously and may have been selling them. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. So one of his handlers was not doing the right thing with the Cadillacs. Got it. From what I was told. Just a quick uh, sidebar with one of my favorite stories. This is uh, one that Raven told me, and I can't remember. Coco Samoa, I believe. May have been the guy who goes, this time, brother, I know sell the gimmick. <laughs> so that was a good one. And Dominic Danucci was told uh, he was doing a steel cage match in um, San Francisco where if you ever, rec- there were some old photos where the, c- the cage would actually be chicken wire. Right. And Dominic was told, whatever you do, he goes, don't tell people it's chicken wire. <laughs> Dominic gets out there to do his promo. He goes, I tell you, this might look like a chicken wire, but it's a no chicken wire. <laughs> My God, it's tremendous. Uh, you've written in your book that uh, Sting was excited to work with you, and after the first couple of matches, um, wh- you know, you, you also said that you made a deal with him, and it was, hey, let's just try what I wanted for the first few minutes. Uh, I know we we don't normally talk like this on the show, but after the first few minutes, does he? Communicate to you. He communicates right, to me that this is going well. Yes. I don't remember his exact words, but he was happy, and he also saw that it took I took care of him. Yes, you know. So there is, if you have a wild style, there might be a tendency to believe you're not looking out for your opponent. 
And I realized early on, like, I, I've got this physical style, I'm, but I'm, I might not take care of myself, but I'm going to take care of that guy. I'm going to take care of everyone that I work with to the point where I've only got a couple people I injured, and I still feel terrible about it. Uh, but I injure? I injured a y- young man uh, when I did the elbow off the ring apron in uh, one of the extra talent. When I came off, he, instead of coming down on his chest, I came down to the point of his chin and it drove his head into the, oh. the sportatorium ground and concussed him. And uh, I did uh, the clothesline, cactus clothesline, uh, tweaked someone's, bi- tore someone's bicep because he held on too long. Oh. And there may have been one or two others over the years, but I never, never wanted anyone to. Um, no, you were the one taking the brunt of it. Yeah, every time. yeah, and I, you know, and I, I laid my stuff in when I, when I had to, uh, but I wasn't ridiculous with it. And Sting liked he always, and he told me twenty years later, he goes, "No, you never hurt me," and he was even ta- he was talking about the forearms, he was talking about uh, whatever moves I did that looked like they may have hurt. He said never. Um, and we did. We had good chemistry. And this is something I said on a previous show. But I, for me, it was a really big moment. And I'm not saying this. This is not a, a knock on Sting at all. Because uh, Clint Eastwood said a wise man's got to know his man's got to know his limitation. Yes. I believe in Magnum Force. So Sting came up to me maybe third or fourth night we worked together. He goes, look, I'm not great at putting a match together. I'm good at interjecting things. So he was pretty much telling me, do your thing and he will contribute. And that's that's what happened. And we just, man, I'm thinking off the top of my head about the submit or surrender match we had. The one where I was wearing the white sting t-shirt and I drew the devil horns on it. And <laughs> nothing but the best for my wardrobe. Sure. Um, and we made great use out of a Rubbermaid garbage can, uh, which, you know, isn't as good as, but you can do more things because it doesn't lose its shape. Right. So Sting splashed me off the top rope, and I don't care if there's a rubber made over you or not. When you don't know when a 250-pound man coming from those heights is landing, it's scary. Yeah. And that was, and if we could find footage, that was the closest I've ever come to executing a strength move to the point where when I saw it maybe five, six years ago, I thought, how did I do that? And what I was doing, I think there was a reversal of a whip. Sting goes to the, he vaults to the second rope and comes off. And I catch Sting in midair. I spin around and drop him over the top rope with a Gilbert hot shot. And I don't know how I did it or how I would even have been so bold to tell Sting that I thought I could catch him in midair, wow. spin him and drop him. But that's the closest I've ever come to doing a power move. And it was it was pretty good. Um, in the Carolinas in mid-91, you and Sting are working every night in United States title cage matches with you putting him over. Any funny cage match stories stand out? <laughs> are you saying that because you know? I'm, I'm legitimately asking. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, this was a few weeks after the legendary uh, Brian Pillman, Sid Vicious altercation. Yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. At the Ramada. I, mu- I stayed at the Ramada during those days, but uh, I must have gone in early. I guess uh, Sid uh, was, I can't remember if Sid was with WWE then or not. Uh, but there was some words between Brian and Sid, and Sid went out to his car and came back <laughs> with a squeegee <laughs> to do some damage. And word got around. You know, there wasn't. It was the inter, the there was no internet. There were hotlines. The hotlines and an un- underground. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, the smart fans of that era. And they had come up with uh, maybe a hundred fans at ringside who had either brought squeegees or made them out of cardboard. I love it. And this was Sting's idea to supercell the squeegee. So that a man who had shown no fear throughout his career, and certainly uh, no fear during my time with him, uh, reacted in an unpredictable fashion when I unveiled my bag of goodies. You know, it was like, you know, the garbage can and the chair, and, and he fought them off valiantly, but brother, when I pulled out a real honest-to-goodness squeegee, 
Sting started like, I don't know if he was screaming, although it sounds good to me, but he started trying trying to climb out of that cage (laughs) and pulling him down. And now we've got the reverse opposite. We got me with the squeegee doing the big Vern Gagne comeback and Sting on his back, you know, on his haunches, you know, scooting back, doing the Memphis backpedal, you know, and it was just a thing of beauty. I'm sure to the 93% of fans who were not in on it, it seemed a little strange. Sure. But it was a it was a fun moment, and it was Sting having some you know levity with his uh, with his character. Tremendous. Uh, when Sting wins the WCW title for the second time, it's February of '92. Were you thinking, uh, well, I'm going to get a title program with him now? No, not necessarily. But I do know that when I was asked about uh, uh, the pay per view, the Beach Blast. I was all in, even though, as we've talked in the past, there it was it was not for the title for some unknown reason. The title. Do you think it hurt you that it was non title? In a weird way, I think people may have been expecting me to win. Yes, of course. Because Dusty had done a good job. He had seen how much fun I had and how much pride I took in the Falls Count Anywhere. And Dusty was like, we're going to make you the king of the Falls Count Anywhere matches, which meant I didn't win a single one. As long as in WC, I won the one with Orndorff when I was a babyface, but uh, I would go around the loop. Uh, there was an interesting, to me, the, an interesting night in Savannah, North Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I was about to say North Carolina. I had Colette with me. I, I think she was pregnant with my uh, oldest son Dewey, uh, and we were staying in Savannah for a couple days, and uh, so she did not come to the matches. I think she was, you know pretty six, seven months along. Um, and I thought I'd get away. I was kind of banged up. I thought I'd get away with some Gaga and I had Sting. I found a plunger for Sting to apply to me. And the Gaga wasn't working that night. It just wasn't. I was trying to sell them something they were not interested in buying. So we had to call audibles and what had been designed as a goofy fun match became a really physical uh, match. To the point where I do, I was literally crawling down the hallway to my uh, door um, because because of the call we'd made mid match to make this thing more serious, and we got it was the match we needed to have for that crowd. Somewhere else they might have gone for it, gone for it, but that night for whatever reason, like I said they weren't buying what I was attempting to sell them. But we had every night was a, was a good match every night. We, uh, we've talked about uh, how you would turn babyface in 1993, and that's when you find yourself on the same side teaming with Sting against Vader and Paul Orndorff. Was it any different being his partner? How was Sting as a tag partner? Well, it was great with the exception of that one night we talked about in the past uh, in Detroit, which I think was a six-man and when I heard those Cactus Jack cheers, I thought, oh, oh, this is not good. Because when Mike Graham came to me with the idea of doing the babyface turn, he said, we need a number two babyface. We've got a number one. Uh, we don't have anyone even approaching that. We need a number two. And as bold as it might seem to sound, say I ever had a chance of being that number one guy, to that f- to the, that audience in Detroit, uh, and and we've seen this over and over, you know, with the organic movements for certain guys, whether it's Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, uh, Sami Zayn. Uh, on that one night, it looked like I was going to be one of those guys, and my feeling right away was that it was not good for the long term future to be getting that kind of reaction. So did you consider yourself at the time the number two baby face? And I, I know there's a threat to being number one. I hear what you're saying there, but I'm just curious from your standpoint, would you, know, you have called yourself the number two baby face? At the I don't time? think I would have ever called myself that because I was pretty comfortable knowing that I had a, a different type of character that did not necessarily need to be in title matches or even at the top of the card or in contention for a belt because I still am a believer in the old fashioned feud, and I was lucky that I wrestled in a time when a blood feud could really be a blood feud. Uh, oddly enough, when Abdullah the Butcher and I split, he was the baby face. But after you know, watching me for a year and a half, or whatever the case was, um, 
yeah, if fans were gravitating that way anyway. And uh, uh, the babyface turn was well received. But I don't know. I'd have to look at that roster to tell you whether I thought I was the number two guy. Sting had this to say about working with you. Cactus was a fun guy to work with. He was a great personality outside of the ring as well. Talk about somebody who sacrificed his body. I mean, I have stories about him in Germany against Vader. I have stories about him in Atlanta with me. Some of the things he did and hearing the sound of his body and his flesh hitting the pavement from I don't know how many feet. I mean, just ridiculous. Uh, He would continue. I was in Germany, by the way, when he wrestled Vader, and you could see him wrestling, and you could see the end of the match. You could see blood coming off the side of Mick's head. He thought he got busted open somehow and no big deal, but the next thing you know... A ring announcer comes around walking in the dressing room with half and three quarters of an ear in his hands. And the thing is, I have my ears and I just went, yep, that's an ear. It was cactus jacks. I mean, he came back in the dressing room and said something like bang, bang. And that was it. I think he wanted to have that thing preserved somehow in some kind of liquid. They didn't want to let him do it. A lot of fun working with cactus. I love his creativity, his willingness to just try stuff and do something different. Step out of the box. And he just. Told really you in cool. such high regard. Where did he say that? Uh, at some interview. I'll go out of my way to send you a link. Yeah, that's really nice to hear. Uh, <laughs> he, he had to be one of your favorite opponents. Oh, you? man, I loved it. I loved it. There was a uh, there was a time when, and Sting was doing double duty, when Jake was in there, and uh, he and Jake had a nice program going. Um uh, in order for Sting to get to Jake, he had to wrestle me first. We were having these really good eight to ten minute matches on the first or second match of the card. And and I guess you can ask Jake. Uh, I, I don't think Sting was crazy about working with Jake. The Jake at that time, uh, 1992, 93 Jake. Um, but I think he can see, I think, yeah, I think he really enjoyed working with me. Okay, guys, let's talk about something that Mick Foley and I have in common. Besides our love of wrestling, it's our love of athletic greens. Both Mick and I start our day every day with AG1. Now, I got to admit, I was actually using AG1 years before they were a sponsor. My wife did her research. She found it, and our family has been using it since 2020. And it's for you if you're looking for better gut health. Maybe you don't feel like you have time and Maybe you want a supplement that actually tastes good. Maybe you want more energy. Maybe you want to optimize your immune system. Well, with one delicious of AG1, you're doing it. Every single day, you're getting 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Everything you need to start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your focus, your recovery, your aging, all of your things. It's also lifestyle friendly. Whether you're trying to eat keto in this new year or paleo or vegan, it's also dairy free and gluten free. By the way, AG1 has less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals. As a matter of fact, no artificial anything, and it still tastes good. What you'll notice is that AG1 helps support better sleep quality and recovery, better mental clarity and alertness. And we like to think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. Now, Mick and I believe in it, but you don't have to take our word for it. Check out their reviews, man. What you'll find is that Athletic Greens has more than 7,000 five-star reviews. Really think about that. When's the last time you left a review for anything? So for 7,000 individual folks to go out of their way to A, leave a review, and B, bring it in at five stars. Come on. Right now, Mick and I want you to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water, y'all. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash Foley. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Foley to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Athleticgreens.com forward slash Foley. Uh, Okay, let's get back to it here. You and Sting have a relationship outside of the business, I'm sure. Um, But Sting has always been a guy who a lot of people uh, think of as more of a loner. You know, he's um, 
a lot of people he used to work out with out in California, I think, just called him Real Estate Steve. They had no idea that he was the man <laughs> called Sting. He was just Real Estate Steve. What is your relationship like with Sting these days? Well, I haven't seen Sting in a long time. It's always good when I see him. Uh, he and I had a deep talk. He's Sting very religious. Uh, deep talk. Is I'm uh, something of a seeker, you know, looking sure. for that uh, better relationship. Uh, with God myself, and he really t- he really takes that, you know, he really feels like that's his calling. Sure. So when I was at uh, Leon White's Celebration of Life in uh, Colorado, Sting was the only other wrestler there. Right. Um, and when he went up to speak, I did not know that he'd been like Leon's spiritual wow. counselor. Like he'd spent a long time with Leon. Leon could be... Leon was cantankerous, you know. Leon, it could be difficult, and uh, but especially when he realized he didn't have much time left, he and Sting became really close. Uh, in a way, I, I wouldn't have predicted. Right. So I, I haven't seen Sting in a while. Uh, when Sting does appearances, he's in for the two three hours. Yeah. So you don't really get a chance to see him that much. Uh, so I haven't seen him in a few years. I think the last time I saw him was at a. Brian Nobbs did one of those uh, Legends of Wrestling shows. That may have been four or five years ago. But we know we'll pick up like that the next time I see him. Well, you did pick right up where you left off. It's weird to think you went all those years without spending any time with him, and then you're both in TNA Mm -hmm. at the same time. Who would have thought? I'm curious, you know, when you're no longer in WCW, did you keep up with the product at all? Oh, yeah, sure. Especially because WCW had that late airing. Yep. So uh, unless we were on the road and, and heading for the next town, if you got to your hotel, you could catch some of it. I don't think I was uh, recording it at that time, but I was catching it, and I was, you know, I was very aware of what was going on in WCW. I, going back to, to my feud with Sting in 91, he told me back then that he wanted to do it a change in character. Really? And basically laid out the groundwork for that that change, you know, that became the darker, character. the darker character. But it was almost exactly like he laid it out for me in uh in ninety one. We've heard the famous story that perhaps it was Scott Hall who was describing the look of the crow. Uh but I, we saw even before that happened, Sting did stop dyeing his hair blonde and wearing the crew cut and he yeah. grew it longer and darker. Uh, you sort of saw, as a fan, the uh, the darker brooding sting, but you wrestled surfer sting. I did, yeah. All these years later, as a fan, do you have a preference as to which would be your favorite sting, surfer well, sting? Well, I only sting? had the, uh, I, man, because I had the history with sting as surfer sting, yep. uh, it's my personal favorite, but there was no denying how hot that other sting character was. Right. And when I came back to, and, and we wrestled again for the first time in many years when I came to TNA, uh, he was wearing the black and white makeup. Uh, he wasn't as, he was more verbal than he'd been when he was red hot in, uh, in WCW. But it was that different type of sting that I wrestled that second time around. Were you surprised that even after WCW went down, when seemingly everyone else came over, the Sting did not. No, because he had a great contract <laughs> with Turner. Well, but I'm saying even when like guys like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan and Goldberg, and as all those contracts sort of left and they were no yeah. longer viable, it seems like all those guys came over. And, and I know eventually Sting did. But Sting ha- I think Sting had an issue with... Content. Content, yeah. And uh, when it, when the Attitude Era gave way to the uh, Ruthless Aggression Era, I think by that time Sting was pretty comfortable with his deal in TNA. I don't think he, wa- he, he two, I think he has two children, two boys. And I think he wanted to be the dad that was around and taking his boys, uh, watching their games and being an active dad. And he was being very well compensated by TNA. I did spend a lot of time with Sting. You know, we uh, a bunch of us had the same dressing room, which is really an office. And it was uh, Sting and me and Booker and Kurt. I think there were maybe one or two people in and out. 
but we'd be there, and Kevin, Kevin Nash. Um, and so I really enjoyed my time with Sting, even if it wasn't uh, in program. But with that being said, I really enjoyed the program I did with Sting. Was that time, like when you're thinking about leaving the WWF and you're thinking about doing something with TNA, is it a consideration to you, like a positive in that regard, that, well, Sting's there, it must be pretty It good. is. Yeah. But when I was, uh, I remember when I first, when uh, TNA first reached out to me, it was Scott Fishman, who I had worked with on uh, Robot Wars, and really liked Scott. So, um, you know, when I'd seen some of the stuff they were doing over there with, uh, you know, as when uh, Shark Boy uh, turned into <laughs> Stone, Stone Cold Steve yes, Austin. Yes. They were doing a lot of fun stuff, and I think Scott, Scott was part of that. Uh, and I happened to get the call from Scott like the day after I was browbeaten over the headphones at the San Diego pay-per-view. Yeah. And if that phone call had come a day earlier, I might have said, oh, thank you, but I'm not interested. And I remember I was parking. I didn't, I didn't want a valet at the Grand Californian. Uh, so I didn't want to pay the extra. So I was self-parking, and I was walking uh, to the hotel and the phone rings and Scott Fishman, uh, would you be interested? And I said, I might be interested. And we took a meeting. My original storyline was supposed to be that I show up, I say, I'm Mick Foley and I've just purchased the X Division. When Scott gave me that, I was like, oh man, I'm in. Like, uh, I, I really wanted to do that. Then it was brought up to me that it they might need to strengthen the brand name before trying to make the the split right and that we're going to have to hold on for a while and then it never happened but that was initially what got me so interested it wasn't really whether or not i was going to get to work with sting but definitely having him around was a was was really a nice plus. bonus yeah. yeah at destination x in 2009 you're the guest enforcer with jeff jarrett as the guest referee sting would defeat kurt angle but during the match you accidentally hit him with a chair and we're going to cover you winning the TNA title next month after your match with Sting at Lockdown. So stay tuned for that. But this is your first time really being around Sting since the WCW days. Was he a much different guy than you remember since he had given his life over to the Lord and gotten a little older? And well, the thing is, I, I wasn't around for that dark period I see. in his life. I didn't even know that Sting had had an issue with substances. So I remember, he, he, he was a big compliment. He kind of laughed the first time we were really sitting down and talking. And, uh, and I said, what? He was like, you are exactly the same, <laughs> which I thought was a compliment. You yes, know? of course. I hadn't changed too much. In some ways I had, but um, in, in some important ways, I was still that same real eager guy that I'd been when I first met him. You weren't jaded. I don't think I was jaded. Yeah. Uh, the main event mafia, of course, is the top heel stable in the company. Uh, what do you think of that group? Sting, Angle, Booker, Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, main event mafia. What do you think? I was so frustrated because we had more more key names in that company than WWE had at that time. Yes, and I remember even when I had my first talk with Vince uh, in a year and a half. And then he left him. He left me a message. I know you don't like me, but I know you love this company. He was wondering if I might be able to do a couple interviews on the company's behalf. And uh, I called him up and I said, "I like you." And during the course of that long conversation, I told him, "I said, Vince, I said, you are, you guys are the Jello of flavored gelatins yes. to the point where most people don't even realize another." Yeah. Flavored gelatin. Knox, excellent flavored gelatin. But nobody says, hey, you got some Knox? It's it's jello, right? Yes. Um, they were doing their elimination chamber, and there were some really pretty minor names in the chamber, meaning at that time, to 2009, to the, that they were really low on big names. And TNA was not. TNA was not. So in the main event mafia, we've got bigger stars than they have in their. This is my opinion. Yeah, no. But I no think doubt. a lot. Of, I think it's open to you know uh, opinions. I think when you've got in the same ring, Sting, 
<laughs> Steiner, Kevin, Booker, Kurt Angle. That's crazy. That's crazy, right? It's crazy. I remember the first time I did a promo, I, my mouth was so dry because I was nervous, you know? I really thought this was like a make or break situation. And in the end, it didn't turn out to be either or. It didn't make or break anyone. It wasn't as good as I hoped it would be. It certainly wasn't a stinker, but it wasn't the landmark promo I hoped to deliver. Uh, but it was frustrating to see this amazing group, this group of great talent uh, that most people didn't even know was on the television. Was it a little odd to position Sting as a member of Main Event Mafia? He's kind of a heel. We don't kind of a heel. He's a heel. not really, right? Yeah. It's not really. Hold on. There was a point. Out. Oh, I know what it was. I was just, uh, I'm, when I was at uh, the Comic-Con in Lafayette, mm -hmm. I see this familiar face who wasn't booked as a, you know, as a guest. It was Nita Strauss, the, oh, wow. the okay. phenomenal guitarist. And um, so I went out to dinner with uh, Nita and her, her boyfriend, Josh, who's a great guy. Um, and we had a three-hour dinner, right, just talking. And, and so uh, Nita was talking about some of that feedback she was getting when she decided to, to go on tour with... Uh, Shinsuke Nakamura? <laughs> not with Nakamura. Demi Lovato. Yes. And so Nita's looking at like she has a chance to play a different type of music, uh, reach different people. Yes. And some of the diehard Alice fans just didn't take kindly to it. And I said, you know, there's no, I said, there's no excuse for people reacting that way with the horrible names and all that. But I did say, I, I said, you know what? It's like, in the same way that people will look at a, a serious Will Ferrell movie and say, that's great. We know you want to do that. We want to understand that. When you decide to be funny again, we'll be here waiting for you. Yes. And that's the way I saw a lot of the wrestling fans. Even a lot of fans were not aware that there was a TNA. Right. And for a lot of them, it's like, we do love you in a certain way, but we love you here. Yes. Not there. And when you go back there, meaning WWE, we'll be there cheering you on, but we're not going to take part in that. And I think all that's fine. So for a lot of guys, uh, or a hand, couple handfuls of people, TNA became this great place to make a really good living during a tough economic time. Oh, yeah. That was, that was the biggest economic downturn in a generation. And here we are getting paid pretty well to show up every couple of weeks to Universal Studios. Yeah. And then hit the road, you know, uh, you, you did hit the road pretty hard. I don't think Sting was on a lot of house shows. Right. I was the guy doing the, you know, the, the photos and, you know, like Don West in the ring pitching for 90 minutes and he was great and they were making a lot of money on merchandise, but the house shows, you know, drew a fraction of what yeah. WWE did. There's a four-way match with you, Sting, Kurt Angle, and Jeff Jarrett called the Ultimate Sacrifice, where you put your title up, Sting puts his career up, Angle puts up the leadership of the main event mafia, and Jarrett puts up ownership of TNA. Maybe a little too much. A little too much, yeah. Um, where I don't think you could, <laughs> even the fan most willing to suspend disbelief would have a hard time believing any of those things are going to happen. There's a great spot in this match. Okay. This is uh, directly from the torch. At one point, a few minutes into the match, Foley went to the announcer's table and started doing commentary. His explanation, he was all blown up and needed a breather. <laughs> and even though beating him was the avowed goal, for several minutes, everyone continued to fight and trade near falls and saves. <laughs> Finally, the only heel... <laughs> was the one who ran to the desk and did a, a flip dive over the desk and knocked Foley out of his Kurt. chair and got him back in the match. <laughs> At one point, Foley pulled out two socks, one for each hand, and did the sock claw on both Jarrett and Sting. Angle made the save. I just love that right in the middle of the match, I'm going to do commentary. Why are you here, Mick? I'm all blown up and I need a breather. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> this is one hell of a title run you've got here, Mick. I'm sorry, I completely forgot about that. I remember when Bruno did that at the garden. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's uh, good stuff. Uh, sorry, Gorilla. I'm blown up. <laughs> <laughs> Dog on it, Gorilla. 
<laughs> I just need a little breather. There was another so similar thing where I think I did. I, I think I made that my thing for maybe three or four weeks. I love it. Uh, wasn't there one where I was teaming up with Jeff when I took the little breather Rooney? And then when Jeff started getting beaten down, I kind of blamed him for not being as good as I thought he was. That's so tremendous. We had fun. You know, if you you're put trying a, new stuff. You're trying new stuff, right? Yes. A lot of a lot of the diehard fans are almost. It's funny because uh, TNA, it it never got that little engine that could type of enthusiasm. Yes. Behind it in the way that AEW has. Or ECW. Uh, uh, or ECW. The uh, and then there were times we'd go to England and it was like. It was we, like that. Oh, it was incredible. Like we were like uh, royalty. You'd go out there and say 8,000 people. Man, that's a lot of people for promotion other than. Um, I can I can count on probably two hands the number of times I saw eight thousand people in the crowd at WCW. Right. So here we are drawing eight thousand in England, and the crowd is red hot for everything. Yeah. Um, but I it didn't seem to have that grassroots little engine that could feeling behind it. You uh, hook up with Sting one more time. It's a three way tag: Samoa Joe and AJ Styles against Sting and Kurt, and you and Jeff Jarrett. Eventually, you both leave TNA. Of course, we know Sting finally joins WWE. He's going to become an enemy of Triple H and the Authority. And I know Are you we weren't... leapfrogging over our title match at Lockdown. Well, we're going to talk okay, about okay, gotcha, okay, We're gotcha. going to talk about that in okay. great detail. Sorry to question you, Podfather. I, I do want to ask about his <laughs> WWE stint because a lot of us were really excited about it, and then. Triple H beat him at WrestleMania, and they turned it into DX versus the NWO. What did you think of the execution of Sting in WWE? I was there at San Jose in a suite for that uh, match, and uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was odd that they all hugged after Triple H had hit Sting with a sledgehammer. Really weird. That's the type of... Sledgehammer takes you a couple days to... uh, yeah. Talk about emotionally to wrap your head around the fact that a human being tried to hit you in the head with a sl- sledgehammer. You don't hug it out. No, you don't. You, you don't hug it out. But they did there. And it was daylight, which makes it San Jose, you know, uh, Pacific. Less than ideal for a Sting debut. Right, yeah. Uh, it, I thought it was fine. It was fine. The one thing I took exception to is when is Sting the portrait is Sting being portrayed as the one guy who held out and held, you know stayed loyal to WCW and it's like <laughs> so <laughs> he's been wrestling every week for TNA TNA. There's this great <laughs> line where uh, who oh Sting Sting coming back. And they're doing the round table in the days leading up to Mania with Michael Cole, Booker, and Nature Boy. And uh, and Michael <laughs> feeds Rick by saying, first time Sting's been in the ring for 10 years. And Rick goes, oh, no, that's not true. He's been wrestling down south. Book, you were there. <laughs> and you see Michael like, we're trying to ignore yes. the truth, which is this is not this guy's first time in 10 years. And also it's like, uh, you know, I look, you get what you get, and yes. you you know sometimes you don't get what you're worth. You get what you negotiate. And I already made it clear that I've made my amends with Mark Merrow, but I was driven by jealousy over his uh, guaranteed contract. And there was that part of me that was like, wait a second, like I've been, you know, I like I have made a good living for a lot, but I have to, I work, you know, yeah. I'm on the road a lot, still. I fly a lot, still doing it. And Sting had a great contract, which is good for him, and that's great. But I was like, but don't portray it as if he's hold, he's the lone holdout when he was being compensated. Like, yeah. I just, I didn't, I didn't, the whole idea of portraying a guy who's been wrestling regularly as a guy who hasn't wrestled in 10 years. A little silly. Is a little, is a little silly, and it is... Uh, it's taken a it's it's taken a shot at the audience's intelligence intelligence yeah. by trying to feed them uh, something that is so demonstrably untrue. Yeah. Um, 
I do want to ask, did you watch his match with Seth Rollins where he was injured? Did you see it live? I did not see it. I can't remember if I was watching it live. This is where I sp see Seth. I remember going to Seth after um, Finn Balor was injured because Brett had mentioned on a podcast that uh, Seth was dangerous. Yep. And I thought I was right there for the uh, Finn Balor match, sitting with Stephanie, you know, best seat in the house. You don't ever want to blame someone for their own injury, but in that case, Finn put his arm back to catch himself. To catch himself, and that's I think where his labrum yep. labrum was torn. And I did an article. It wasn't a widely you know read article, but I theorized that in the same way where I remember watching Muhammad Ali at age thirty four. And they were in Howard Coast. I was like, the legs are the first thing to go. At 34 years old, your legs would go. Now, 34 of a wrestler is sort of you're just getting into your prime, right? Because you can, even if you're not in your physical prime, your ability to work with the audience and to learn the craft and all that is on the upswing. But I'd wondered if the legs were the first thing to go for a boxer. Could the neck be the first thing to go for a wrestler? Wow. Because, the, and I know I've had trouble, even when I would go back to watch, and I'd be like, why am I getting my bell rung right. repeatedly on things that aren't even that bad? And I was like, oh, it's harder to keep, it's harder to keep that tin, chin chucked to your chest. So I would see even on a regular bump, instead of being this, it would be this. Boom, and here goes the head. So I think that would be why Undertaker received the concussion working with Brock Lesnar. And I think that may have been why Sting was so badly, it was badly injured with the buckle bomb. Yeah. Not because Seth did it wrong, but because he was a guy in his 50s, right? It was the straw that broke the camel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I did not think, yeah, that was, I mean, at Sting, they've done a nice job in AEW yes. uh, of, Working, working, around it, it. working around that. But to try to put a guy Sting's age and to have him expect him to work up to Seth Rollins, you know, that's that's unrealistic, that's unrealistic at this point. Do you think, uh, first of all, I think we both agree it's great that Sting's in the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah. I'm glad we got to see that. But I think a lot of fans think about that WWE run and they think, man, we just wanted that one match with The Undertaker and no one could have ever predicted the way the world was going to change with the pandemic. But they could have, in an alternate universe, did one hell of a cinematic match. Could yeah. they not? Right, yeah, they could have. I don't think we'll see it now, but we are seeing Sting almost being Foley-esque in AEW. My man's jumping off balconies and going through tables. and I, I don't think I would have predicted that he would have this resurgence in AEW that he has, but it's been fun to watch. Yeah, it certainly has. So he's no longer with Darby, right? I mean, I don't think they're doing that officially, but they are still pals. Pals, okay. Yeah. But he's, Darby's not been revealed as things goth son. No, no, right? yeah. Okay. okay. Is that is that an angle you're pitching here? No, I just I remember a great meme where they had a photo of Sting shaking hands <laughs> with one of the opponents saying, "Thank you for wrestling my me, goths." <laughs> me and my son. Yeah, it's tremendous. <laughs> That's so great. I just love it. Um. Adam Leeson says, who does Mick believe was a more important opponent for him in the course of his career, Sting or The Undertaker? Well, it's apples and oranges because Sting was the most important in WCW. There you go. Undertaker was the most important in WWE. My estimate, based on people recognizing me and being able to actually sit in the crowd with a baseball hat, with all my hair tucked up under my uh, baseball cap, but I was able to sit in the friends and family section like in my sixth month with WWE was that not as many people were crossover fans as we thought. Right. That maybe 20% of the WWE fans uh, were aware of what was going on. Right. You know, they might know the top names. And, you know, when I was revealed as Cactus Jack in September 97, there was a big pop. But that might be a huge pop coming from a, you know, from a small percentage of the fans. Um, so I think, yeah, you were almost working in two different universes, uh, WWE versus WCW. Uh, Match Wrestling Study Podcast wants to know, what are your thoughts on Joker staying in that character in 2011? 
man. <sighs> he didn't like it. I guess by virtue of taking a deep <laughs> breath and having to think about that is it. That's the answer. I, I'm not crazy about all of the people who became Joker-esque, mm -hmm. whether it was in music or wrestling. Um, yeah, I guess it's telling on how, it's like the Heath Ledger Joker, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I wasn't, wasn't crazy about it. Uh, last one. Mike wants to know, did Mick prefer Sting's solo work or the police more? <laughs> and next week, we're going to be talking about WrestleMania 14, 25 years ago in Boston. You and Terry Funk took on the New Age Outlaws in a tag team dumpster title match. Uh, Steve Austin's going to become the man. We also see Kane versus The Undertaker the very first time. And we'll, see, we'll also talk about your rematch the next night on the uh, cage match for Raw is War. Uh, by the way, if you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Check out adfreeshows.com this Friday at St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. And we've got it jam-packed with seven new pieces of bonus content. Our lucky seven will feature a bonus overrun that we just did with Mick. Plus, we'll be answering all of your questions about Sting and doing a bonus episode with Eric Bischoff, Jake Roberts, a brand new Ask Conrad, and a whole lot more. It's all tomorrow, St. Patrick's Day at adfreeshows.com. The easiest way to follow the show and to keep in touch is to check us out on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. It's at Foley is Pod. Of course, you can watch our videos, and if you haven't seen it, you're missing out. It's something like we've never seen before with a wrestling podcast. It's Foley on YouTube.com, and we've got a bunch of great new swag at FoleyIsPodShirts.com, including the now infamous Mr. In Your House cameo oh, shirt. Nice, yeah. uh, and, of course, we've got cameo out the wazoo, man. We're still chasing... Trying to get back your rightful place as the most requested. You are the most reviewed athlete. Most reviewed. I'm at a little over 4,700 reviews, which is almost triple of any other wrestler or athlete. I can tell you in good conscience, I still love doing these things, Conrad. I really do. And I take the opportunity. Wardrobe changes. Songs. The wardrobe changes, the songs. I have to sit down and craft uh, another handful of songs. But, you know, when you go in, you think you're hearing, you think you're, you're just hearing dude love giving, right. he is singing, uh, uh, talking about your birthday bash to the tune of rocking around the Christmas tree. And then before your very eyes, when it says, dude goes, you will get this kooky, you kind of feel it when you hear Cactus Jack say, and then a change in half a second. He goes from being dude love to Cactus Jack saying, I'm not begging, but save some cake for the hardcore legend. That's good stuff, right? I need to find a few more things uh, to write. Uh, the secret cameo life and wrestling is to tweak the image, to yes. tweak before people realize it needs tweaking. I love it. Tell everybody where to find you on Cameo. Cameo.com slash Mick Foley. By the way, if your business targets men 25 to 54 years old, buddy, there's no better place to advertise than right here in Folius Pod. You've heard us do some of these same ads over and over and over. Why is that? Because it really works. And with our super targeted audience, there's very little waste. Go right now to advertisewithfoley.com. That's advertisewithfoley.com. And by the way, we want you to try adfreeshows.com. How bad? We're letting you try it for free. Go sign up for a trial. It's uh, free right now at adfreeshows.com. That'll do it for us this week, talking about Sting. Next week, WrestleMania 14, right here on Foley is Pod. Yeah. Hey, guys, Eric Bischoff here. I just want to call a quick timeout. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over 83 weeks, quite a while now, about all the cool things that are happening over at AdfreeShows.com. The wrestling wars are heating up as David Crockett and Conrad revisit March of 1985 on The Book. Vince has brought WrestleMania 1 to life, while Jim Crockett Promotions is preparing to be back on TBS television. And you got Dusty Rhodes and Tully Blanchard on top, Magnum TA and Ivan Koloff for the U.S. title, $5,200 at the gate. And meanwhile, while that show's happening, WrestleMania is becoming a thing, and uh, the wrestling wars are about to heat up, because just one week from now, you guys are back on TBS. Former WWE executive John Filippelli sits down with Conrad on an all-new edition of The Insiders. 
and discusses his tumultuous relationship with Bruce Pritchard during his time with the company. Vince was trying to, I think there were times where he tried to sort of get us to try and work together better than we were. And I, I was quite candid. I was quite candid about how I felt about him, about that I didn't appreciate you know, him undermining us or me. And I uh, I would have no part of it. And I told Vince, if he doesn't straighten his act out, I don't want, he, he's got to go. Either he goes or I go. Ad Free Show's members recently got to chat live with the enforcer, Arn Anderson. And hear stories of legends like the late, great Bobby the Brain Heenan. Sharpest, funniest, wittiest guy there's ever been on this earth. I could look at Bobby and go, hey, Bobby, you got a bump on your neck. Before I could get neck out of my mouth, he had to come back. Boom, boom, boom. And just hilarious. That's